Welcome to the Data Center Hawk Podcast. Today we're in part two of our series on hyperscale, talking about location strategy. The top three things that hyperscale users will use to evaluate where to go are really speed to market, scalability, and cost. You're listening to the Data Center Hawk Podcast, where we demystify the data center market. Data Center Hawk is your online platform for data and commentary on the data center market. Stay tuned and be sure to join the thousands of others who rely on Data Center Hawk to make decisions in the data center space. Okay, welcome to the Data Center Hawk podcast. I am Mike Netzer, joined, as always, by David Liggett, the man who once played rugby in a data center with the CEO of that company. You don't believe me? It's on our podcast. Mm -hmm. David, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Mike. Great to be here with it's you. It's great to be here with yes. you. So Good today to we're you. talking about hyperscale. Yeah. Uh, and I'm always struggling, like it's not hyperscale users, it's not hyperscale companies, it's not hyperscale data centers, it's kind of a, it's all of the above. Yes. So I'm, I've, I've struggled with how to say it on this podcast, but hopefully people can understand well, and see sure. and appreciate the, the nuance yes. of this topic. All right, so today we want to talk about you know, why companies choose to build slash lease. Uh, we have a tongue twister coming up, by the way. It's you get excited. No. Uh, you know what's driving their location strategy? Because you know to understand the hyperscale company, you yep. must be uh, the hyperscale <laughs> company. <laughs> you must become. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're trying to do is is communicate how these companies make these decisions about where to put their infrastructure. So let's start there. Let's just talk about you know different types of companies that kind of would fit in that category yeah. of hyperscale and and why you know how how that impacts their location yeah. strategy. There's really and as we've talked, there's really two different categories of groups, at least that we've seen over the last five years or so that uh, fit into the hyperscale model. You know, one is companies that, um, you know, traditionally are like cloud service providers. And so they have like scalable needs. These would be like the AWS's, the Microsoft's, the Google's, like those type of companies that have seen their offerings grow significantly, even before COVID. But Certainly the pandemic has increased that. And then and then on the flip side, you would have social media or SaaS companies. And they have large growth infrastructure needs as well, but they're a little different. That is our SaaS slash social. Say that three times. Fast. I'm not going to. <laughs> not a good that would just be it's the, on my notes. That would be the bloopers. SaaS that's with what a slash would start, social. Yeah, that's yes. what would start this podcast with maybe like tongue twisting. Snibby, that. Yes. Yes. Um, but right. those are the two categories. And and so each uh, each group you know, I would say has located like, like physically located their data center portfolio in different places for different reasons. Um, and, you know, if you think back to like 10 or 15 years ago, these companies, some of them actually didn't exist, but the ones that did had a totally different strategy from a location perspective, which was, and we've got to put this in more rural areas where we can take advantage of tax incentives, infrastructure that might've been like, uh, like leftover from other industries that had, you know, seen their, um, you know, seen the industry like decrease from a size perspective over a period of time. So you had additional like power or water that was unused. So that's um, like Google in Council Bluffs, Microsoft in, was it Des Moines? Yeah. And so then, yeah, those yeah. are areas, but I, but like one that comes to mind is like in North Carolina, as an example, like the textile industry, mm. you know, 20 to 30 years ago was, very big in that area so there was a lot of power and water being used to um to make that happen and as that industry changed um you know that power and infrastructure was almost left behind and so some of the data center users 10 or 15 years ago that are in that area of the country went and had the opportunity to kind of like take advantage of the fact that that was there that makes that's sense. a fun uh, topic for another podcast. Like in Dallas, for example, there's a bunch of data centers that have risen out of like old newspaper facilities yep. that were, you know, they've got that the floors to support. Yeah, sure. Anyway, interesting. Yes. It but my, my point is, is that if you look back 10 or 15 years ago, that is how those companies were choosing to locate. You, you mentioned a few of those locations, but like rural North Carolina, um, you know, in uh, right outside of Des Moines, Iowa, um, you know, in Oregon, like just different places. What we have seen over the last five years, specifically with the cloud service providers, is their desire to be closer into larger cities. Mm -hmm. And that, and not just that desire, but also the amount of capacity they need in those markets. And so that has changed significantly the opportunities in areas like Northern Virginia, Chicago, Phoenix, Dallas, Atlanta, 
Northern California and in international markets as well, because those companies have really been trying to like mature what they their, their infrastructure. Um, so that's how they've chosen to approach it. And then on the uh, the tongue twister, God, now you got the social <laughs> slash. Sass. Sass companies. God. <laughs> this is a brutal. Jerk. I don't, we, had a, um, we had to rename that one. That's like right. Tier 2 or well, B, it's hard, B yeah. Team. I mean, so they basically have done it a, a bit different. Their, their needs are like traditionally smaller than the cloud service providers. They're still large. This but, company's like Salesforce, LinkedIn, yeah. Uber, yes. Twitter. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. We were having a conversation. You and I were talking uh, with one of the co-location guys, and, and he was saying, you know, s- not not every company is going to have the same list here, but they're all going to have a list yeah. of who they're pursuing. And, and some of these, you know, customers like yep. we just named are they will do business with certain providers, not others, just yeah. based on some of this strategy we're talking about. Yeah. And so everyone's going to have a different list. But but but, you know, assuredly, they all have a list. Yeah. And I because think the, the money, the opportunity is so great for these companies. Right. And it's it's huge. I mean, one of those companies that you just mentioned could take a whole facility, sometimes like a whole campus, just depending on what the needs are. So that's the way we've seen them, you know, break down and, and moving, I'll just go back to moving that demand back towards these more mature data center markets has changed the industry. I mean, that is what, like, if you look at our metrics as we track, you know, market growth and like multi-tenant market growth, multi-tenant planned power growth, where land banking is taking place, like all those increases and changes really point back to this trend in the industry, which is those companies changing their approach over the last four or five years. The other thing that's really important is that these companies have a dual strategy to building and versus leasing. And that might be something we're gonna talk about here in a second, but but we definitely see that play out with some of these companies. Yeah, what would impact, you know, I keep coming back to this graph, I think it was like on a DCD conference or something that showed, um, it was a vendor that tracks what they call their Hyperscale 20, which I think we're probably loosely aligned with ours. <clears throat> and they said, they tracked the build versus lease over time. Yep. And I think from 17, 18, 19, which is when the slide was, the the build percentage had, was decreasing mm-hmm. and the lease percentage was increasing. So why would that be, and, and, and what do you think is driving that? Uh, I think that it's very large capacity needs and the timing that it takes to build these you know, facilities. I mean, construction on data center sites, and you know, once you acquire the site, once you start building the base, you know, building construction, and then once you start delivering the mechanical and electrical equipment, you know, that can be a 12 to 36 month time period, just depending on market, permitting, zoning, engineering of the, all those things. So I think the timing aspect is, is really important. And as these companies are trying to figure out, Hey, how to put our infrastructure together in a way that serves our customers. Great. They, they have to utilize all the things they have. And so some of that's like long-term strategy, which is, Hey, let's go buy a site, build it, own it, operate it over time. And then others is let's utilize the capital, the economies of scale, and the construction expertise of these third-party data center operators to deliver the capacity faster and, and us get online quicker. Okay, so when you're looking across you know, the landscape of these hyperscale companies, what do you think are like the top three things that they're taking into account every time they place either building or lease some infrastructure? The way these companies are thinking about market growth and strategy really depends on their customers and what the customers uh, needs are and the applications that that hyperscale uh, users are providing to their customers, um, how those applications are performing. So that really is going to determine market or geography, and and how that plays out. Once they have that established, you know the top three things that hyperscale users will use to evaluate where to go are really speed to market, scalability, and cost. You know, let's talk a little bit about the the users' needs. You talked about like wh- how they even select a market to begin with. Yep. Um, you know, I think all of the cloud service providers specifically have like this concept of regions and zones. Um, so, how does that play into and and like the concept of latency? Let's talk a little bit about what that means because I think yeah. some people think of of data. You hear like fiber optic cables or speed of light. What does it really matter if it's next door or across the globe? Yeah. It's the speed of light, right? Uh, sure. But but that's a real concern. That is a legitimate concern. Um, 
So let's talk a little about like how that factors into you know the to getting from the we need to find a specific market. The first part of your answer before yeah. and and how that plays into kind of location strategy. Yeah, the I, th- I think one of the important things to remember is that every company that is going to execute on one of these larger data center requirements has very like specific company needs and that are different than other you know companies. I mean, there's certainly some similarities in where companies are locating, but uh, a lot has to do with their internal strategy. A lot has to do with the way they set up, you, you mentioned it, availability zones or some, I would say, smaller products that they're offering the market related to um, cloud services, et cetera. So that's that certainly is part of it. And it's really important to consider. You know, it's funny when I was at CBRE, I would always remember we would work with companies to figure out where they needed to go and who they needed to partner with and all those things. But there was always one or two internal company requirements that really shifted where the opportunity went. And it was specific to that company. So I think you see that playing out on the larger, these larger opportunities as well. You know, cloud on ramps and where those are located certainly are helping drive a lot of the um, the discussion for uh, data center operators and getting those cloud on ramps within their site. Again, that's just like a direct path to the cloud provider. So the reason companies like that is because it can speed up their um you know, applications, and there's certainly an advantage to being within close proximity to where those cloud on ramps are. Uh, but but that's that's at like a smaller level. At the, at the larger level, you're seeing the or we we are watching these companies establish regions and locations in areas that are going to serve users that are utilizing their platform or businesses that are you know use, utilizing their platform, uh, and then also in a way that. Um, completes their portfolio, you know, and, and, and comes in and, and fills out that strategy. You know, we've seen that play out over the last, I mean, if you just look at the U S you know, we know we're working on a product right now that helps shape some of the picture helps tells the story of how the market has grown related to some of these larger companies. And you can just see the pockets growing, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and it comes back to, I mean, this all comes back to business needs. It all comes back to the way consumers are utilizing you know, the social or SaaS products that are, are growing and they've grown so much in the last couple of years, it, it's just all, fit, you know, supporting those needs. And so, you know, whenever you, sometimes it's easy to like forget that, I think, in our space, but it all comes back to what we are doing to push the infrastructure needs of these companies. And, you know, to their credit, they have thought through how to build and operate their infrastructure in a way that serves those needs you know, better today than they did three, five, ten years ago. So you kind of touched on this a little bit, like kind of looking forward. Yes. You know, where do we see, you know, some of this hyperscale growth or, you know, location evolution changing going forward? Is it kind of more of the same or what does that look like, you know, five, ten years out? Yeah, you're definitely going to see more of the same. And a lot of that is because companies, when they start to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into these facilities, um, the equipment that goes into them, the networks that they build around them, there is value in taking advantage of that investment over time and putting other uh, facilities within close proximity. So I think you will see more of the same in some of these markets. Yeah, but but I do believe that there are some areas that are s- starting to get harder to bring capacity online in, in the, and I'm speaking in the U.S. specifically. And so that will push demand into some other areas and you know where those are I mean you might look at like a lower you know close close proximity to those markets but maybe lower real estate costs we've seen real estate and this is pre-pandemic but we've seen real estate costs around data center land sites uh, soar over the last two years three years Um, we you know I always used to say like it's it's a rounding error when it comes to the the greater cost of the project. And it's still a very small cost when you consider the amount of money that goes into a data center project over time, but it's become much more significant over the last several years. Um, And so I think that will push demand into some other places. So there are certainly some other secondary markets that we call secondary, just smaller data center markets today that are growing. Um, 
you know, probably the two that interest me most right now are Salt Lake City uh, and Port- Portland or Hillsboro, the area outside of of Portland that you've seen hyperscale skill users validate as like, hey, that's where we would we would go. And when you see that happening and that growth start to take place, that can change very fast. So I think we did a Portland podcast maybe, I don't know, sometime in the last two years. We'll dig it up. Yeah, and, and the but but the thing that was interesting about that was the the way that market like has doubled in size over the last two years. Yeah. And we just don't see that happening a lot. You know, to, to double the Dallas market, it would take a while. To double Chicago would take a while. Um, so I think those are areas that you, I think you'll see more of the same in some of the bigger markets. But then some of those smaller markets, you'll see some growth because those companies are certainly interested in the, those those spots today. You know, it's funny. You did a uh, podcast with Bruce Lehrman uh, yeah. from Involta. And he made this comment of like, hey, we spent the last 20 years getting everything out of enterprise data centers and into like these core, yep. uh, you know, metro area data yeah. centers. He goes, he goes, I think we're going to spend the next 20 years pushing everything out. Yeah. And I think you can see that in some of these way these hyperscale companies are, you know, buying, putting out like they've got their massive, you know, 50 sure. megawatt data centers, but they're also like putting out like call them like nodes yeah. or oh, local absolutely. zones or what have you. They're pushing out the data. Like I think, you know, there is some ideal state where the right data is in the right place at the right yeah. time. And honestly, it's probably like, you know, we all talked about this before, like your phone is a data center. It's a little tiny one. Yeah. Uh, and at some point in the future, there is this massive like distribution out where you, not everything's in the main location. So yeah. do you see that, you know, how is that impacting strategy like kind of over the next, call it five years? Uh, I think it's fueling a lot of the like edge products that are out there. And, and um, so that's part of just the idea of like, distributing the, the the workloads to different physical locations. That's one thing. Two would be, you know, those companies, a small requirement for them might be two to five megawatts, and that's got to go somewhere. Just a little. Pick yeah. it up while you're at the store. Sure. So, get some eggs and five megawatts. There you go. So uh, that that is pushing, you know, a, a competitive level for the data center operator community to win those requirements. And, you know, one of the challenges is a lot of those companies have similar expectations as it relates to rate and deal structure (laughs) on some of the smaller requirements that they would on some of the larger requirements. And so that's the tension that a lot of people feel right now in the space. And, um, and that will work itself out. I mean, that's the, the, that's the great thing about an open market and being able to compete is that you have people that will do that, some people that won't, some people that win, some people that lose, and that's that's part of watching this space go through this evolution, you know. And we are like I would say we are right in the middle of one of the largest growth periods we have ever seen in this market, you know, in this industry. Um, and and so it's it's really it's really a fascinating place to sit. You know, when I got in the space in 07 or 08, I feel like it was just when you know, if you've been in the industry a while, you know the, the wholesale co-location, that world just started to grow. And now we're in this this hyperscale age of our uh, of, of the industry, and it's really fun to watch. Yeah, I think one, before we wrap it up, one last thing is like, you know, talk a little bit about how the co-location providers are organizing themselves to kind of align with what they perceive to be this is the location strategy of these companies, like the the ways that they're buying land, yep. the ways that they're organizing their, you know, kind of yeah. roadmap or, or pipeline. Right. One, I mean, I'd say the first organization that has taken place is the access to capital. And you, that's why you see a lot of announcements about companies, data center operators that are raising money to do that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that down the road. Maybe I just <laughs> spoiled something, but that's part of it. Uh, two would be what you do with that capital, like buying land and, and positioning yourself so you don't have to go through that permitting process. It, it highlights the, the hyperscale company or hyperscale user trend of the speed to market. Uh, what's the, what's, how can we compress the timelines? One is by already having the land entitled, zoned, permitted, ready to go. Um, so that's part of it. Another part is them uh, getting more mature with their supply chain. So they're building all of the, all of the component or many of the components offsite. I think that's that's an underappreciated oh my gosh. In, a part of it. You know, that you, podcast you did with Tim Hughes? Yes. He said he's basically spent the last year yeah. that he's been at Stack, like getting all these companies lined up. I mean, it's herding cats. Well, and, and just that's the organizational side. Then if you like, so a couple weeks ago, we were in Northern Virginia and 
just walking through. So one of the data centers that, that, that I toured, I'm not sure if you were there, you had left by them, but you know, they are loading these, these gigantic generators. Uh, you know, the UPS systems are put together. I mean, the things that are put together off site and then brought to this uh, site, it's, it's amazing. And that speeds up the timeline. So, um, you know, and then the other part is just being able to understand, listen to the customers. I, I, that's probably the biggest thing, you know, 10 years ago, it was about, Hey, we know how to build data centers and this is what we do. And you need to adjust to us. Mm. That has totally flipped. So now it is, Hey, what do you need? How do you build? What are you doing? Great. We can do that. And we can, and we believe we can do it not in a bad way, but faster than you, because this is all we do. You know, these companies certainly have teams that do that, but they are, I mean, there's so much going on that, that these data center operators can come in and help speed up timelines, you know, meet the costs that they need to and deliver a great product. And, and when you can do that in the right markets in the right time, hey, everybody's a winner. Everybody's a winner. <laughs> win, win, win. And then you win because you negotiated that. That's right. We all win. That's and right. I get a win because I get to watch you do it. That, you got it. So that would be a five. That's five wins. Five wins total if you're Whoa. counting. All right, David, great thoughts uh, as always. Uh, so this was part two of our Hyperscale series talking about location strategy. Next we'll do uh, part three. We'll be talking about these large um, companies, how, how they've impacted the industry overall. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll catch you next time.